Welcome to Flock Talk, Flock Talk, the podcast where we feature your favorite authors and narrators. Hosted by Craig Hart and Sarah Hannon. Visit us today at pinkflamingoproductions.com. Pink Flamingo Productions. And now, Flock Talk. Hello, all you happy flockers out there, and welcome to Flock Talk. My name is Craig Hart, and I'm here with my urbane co-host, Sarah Hannon. How are you today, Sarah? I find myself in need of a dictionary, Craig. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I also think you're sophisticated. Oh, thank you. (laughs) Uh, It's at the end of it. I've been narrating quite a bit today. And so backing up a while back, I I narrated this book or part of it. It It was a dual project. And one of the relatively minor characters, I gave something of a raspy voice. Well, the author, she wrote another book in that series featuring that character. Raspy guy? Yeah. And and it's in first person. So the entire thing is this, uh, I've moderated the rasp a little bit, but still it's like, it's really starting to take a toll on me. So I'm about halfway through. (laughs) I'm just hoping I can make it through. I had a book where I had a minor character in the first book. It was a trilogy. I had a minor character in the first book. And in the second book, she comes back as like a bad guy with a mountain southern accent. <laughs> what? And I was like, in the first book, I'd made her kind of like sassy and cute and, you know, brief. Yeah, and you just don't always know. I mean, I suppose if there are existing books, sometimes you can look look ahead, but not always. And some in this, in, in my case, this wasn't even written yet. So Yeah, I, I learned, it was, I learned to ask questions. Right, <laughs> Questions exactly. that I'd ask. <laughs> Well, we have a great guest today. Uh, Would you mind introducing our guest to all the listeners? Yeah, I am really excited because Marie Johnston is here. She is an award-winning, best-selling writer of paranormal and contemporary romance and a Rita finalist. Marie decided to pursue her passion for writing and traded in her lab coat for a laptop to write her first book ever, Fever Claim. She lives in the upper Midwest with her husband, four kids, and old Kitty. Other than hanging out with her family, Marie enjoys reading, movie dates with her hubby, getting outside on sunny days, and the all-too-rare girls' night out. Welcome, Marie. Hello. Thanks for having me. I would like to know, as a diehard science geek, how did you find your way to exploring your creative side through writing books? I started probably like a lot of authors that I've heard um, tell how they got started as an avid reader as a kid. I wrote a few short stories in high school with the old MS-DOS computer and the paper printer that had the holes in it. (laughs) The holes in it. Yeah. I still have those, too. I find them every once in a while. I can hear it printing right now in my head. I can, too. I can, too. (laughs) You can hear that picture. when you Makes me a little twitchy. (laughs) And then I went to college. I had thought about being an editor in high school, which would not have been a good fit for me because I I don't like rereading the same stuff. And then I went the science route in college. And after we were only going to have two kids and we decided to go from two to four. And I thought if I have a third kid, I don't want to put them in daycare for 10 hours a day, five days a week, even though my job was as a public health microbiologist, it was no holidays, no weekends. It was just a lot um, every day to juggle kids in the job. So it worked out that I could stay at home. Um, And I kind of dabbled with fiction, but I thought, what would I... It was more nonfiction. And I thought, I don't know enough about anything to write a nonfiction book. And I'd sit down and try to write, and it would sound like a dear diary of my day. And I kind of... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> kind of gave up on it. And I was really getting into um, romance and paranormal. And J.R. Ward was my favorite author. And I just tell my husband, like, oh, she's just, it's intimidating. She's such a good writer. I don't think I can do this. And he said, well, she had to start somewhere too, just right. And I never did until I watched, we were, I watched the morning news every morning. And they had a new segment on Jacinda Wilder and her success with indie publishing. And that was the first I'd heard of it. So one day shortly after that, I um, was sitting down trying to figure out, I was still working. I'd gone back part-time to work in a clinic lab, and I was juggling my schedule. And even though our kids were young, they were still in activities, so I was juggling their schedules. My husband is in the military, and he works full-time. He's not active. He's guard, but he works full-time for the guard um, and still has all the M-Day duties 
the one week in a month, two weeks a year, extra training and all that. I was like, how are we going to do this? There's only one of me and I got kids in two different places, sometimes two different towns. <laughs> how yeah. are we going to do this when we're working? So I started looking into traditional and indie publishing. So I started writing to make it a business shortly after that. Um, and I thought, traditional publishing, it could take years to make money. And little did I know that was going to happen anyway. <laughs> 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 you went into it, though, with the idea of making it a business. Yes. I think that's one of the things that, you know, indie authors struggle with. It's tough to juggle that creative side and that business side at the same, at the same time. Yes. And, you know, until you start viewing your writing as a business, it's tough to get anywhere. And I had zero background in business or marketing. I always say there was really nothing about my science career that is helping me other than I'm maybe not intimidated by data. <laughs> but it's not like I want to sit and design a spreadsheet either. I don't care to go through loads of information and numbers. But if I have to, I will and I'll interpret it. But that's pretty much the only thing I brought with me from my former career. Everything else I hate to say has been kind of was, you know, useless <laughs> for what I'm doing now. <laughs> so it's been a ground up building yeah. this business for myself. I always laugh when I think of when I was quitting, I hadn't decided to leave until I was on maternity leave. And I thought, wow, we are really chill right now. <laughs> there is no, you know, racing to get out the door with kids so I can be my standard five minutes late for work. <laughs> and so I did end up quitting on maternity leave. And I thought, oh, what am I going to do about technology? I don't have an IT department. I'm going to not, I'm going to fall behind on what I know. And it's like now, it's like, what program do I have to download and learn to, this week? So what made you go from two children to four children? Did you I have tw think, twins? Surprise twins? No. I you just didn't. decided to double? We, we thought we weren't going to do the, <laughs> again, the blissful ignorance. We weren't going to do the middle kid syndrome, right? So now we have two middle kids. Um, so, <laughs> so they can we, share that job. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so we did go from two to four, but my, my second oldest got to be about three and we had, it was a little bit of a bumpy road with my first one because my husband was deployed with him and they didn't let him come home. So it was me knowing nothing about kids, having never babysat or had little mm -hmm. siblings or cousins, uh, raising a baby in a town we had just pretty much moved to. So it was a bumpy road, and then my second one came along, and my husband was deployed again. So our oldest was four to five. Each was a year at a little over a year at a time. And then after that, when he had, I mean, he hasn't been deployed for those lengths since then. Um, but when she got to be about three, it was like, wow, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're done with the baby stage, which is weird because the baby stage is so hard on me. Um, I have babies who do not like to sleep, and I love to sleep. <laughs> but we we went for it, and we have we have four now. You did That's it. That's brave. That's really brave. <laughs> uh, you have many different series, one of which is Oil Kings. Can you tell yeah. us about that series? I wanted to bring my kind of Western feel closer more to more Western, because when I did my first kind of small town Western series, I'm in North Dakota, and you, n nobody really, that's not in a lot of literature. It's not in a lot of, not a the setting for a lot of places, except even Fargo isn't in North Dakota. I mean, Fargo is, but like the movies and the shows aren't really in the state. So I was hesitant to bring it here. And so I put my fictional town on the other side of the Red River in Minnesota, um, and I would joke it was so my in-laws wouldn't think I was talking about them because it was like <laughs> directly, <laughs> directly on the other side of the river from them. <laughs> and it just didn't have the same feel. And I got some bad reviews about how Minnesota is only for dairy farmers because some of my heroes ranched, too. And I thought, well, my husband and I had just um, went to Billings for the weekend. And I thought, why don't I put it in eastern Montana? Because we was family of six. We don't travel a whole lot. And we don't cram ourselves in one vehicle and take long road trips. But Billings is six hours from where I live, and we had just been there. And I thought, I can do eastern Montana, and it would still be the Montana western setting. So I sat, and, and it was shortly after the oil boom out here in North Dakota, and we're still very energy rich. We have coal, we have oil, we have wind, and eastern Montana also has a lot of oil. So I wrote that into 
the setting and kind of made the oil money be a thing. And um, mineral rights is also another since the oil boom. You can't, in my experience, um, limited hearing people talk, you can't really buy a lot of land anymore and get the mineral rights. Like we just bought 15 acres a few years ago um, and we didn't get mineral rights for our little portion of land. So people hang on to those pretty tight. So I kind of wrote that conflict into the series and I combed Amazon looking for tropes <laughs> and I made a <laughs> list of tropes of when I wanted to write. So that's how Oil Kings came about. I picked Kings, you know, because it, it, I mean, it went with Oil Kings really well. And then when I was making my, thinking of my next series, I'm getting better at planning ahead of time. And I thought I'd kind of loosely tie them together and I hadn't planned on the Oil Connection and then I was trying to think of a family name. And um, Baron is a family name. And so I thought, well, of course that connects with you have Oil Kings, Oil Baron. So I have series planned. We've got, with all the royalty <laughs> behind oil. Um, so I can write in this world for a long time. And I, I hope I'm able to. You're talking about getting better about planning ahead. Speaking of that, now you have several books up for pre-order in different series I was wondering, what is your typical timeline for writing a book, and how do you decide which series to write in next? I should be more strategic about that. And every year I tell myself, okay, we're going to quit writing in so many series at once. I've got to <laughs> knock this off. And every year I don't. And I have, everyone's talking about their cool Clifton strengths. And I did, I did do the quick test and got my top five, and I hadn't really paid much attention to them. And everyone's talking about their, is it achiever and activator and input and really cool stuff. And I finally looked at mine, and it's like responsible. And then I can't remember the top one if it's reformer, but it's like even more responsible. And I thought those are the least fun <laughs> strengths ever. But that is why I cannot start a series. And even if the data tells me to, this probably isn't your moneymaker, I've got to finish it because I committed to it. And I committed, even if two readers asked me when I'm going to get those books out, if I told them I'm going to get them out, I'm going to get them out. So that's why I end up sticking with all the series and making more. And I don't seem to have an issue flip-flopping from paranormal to contemporary to I have another one that treads on the romantic suspense. It's a little harder for me to write, so I, and then longer, so I try to give myself more time. And then I um, fit dictation in, but I try to avoid that because it takes so much more editing, and I'm a typo-heavy writer anyway, and then dictating is magnifying the typos. It takes <laughs> right. so much cleanup. So I do try to actively write it, and I get a lot of my bulk times writing at, at practices in my car, my mobile office. <laughs> That's how I'm able to get the most word count in. Well, you're finishing what you start. Uh, those are your Midwestern values coming out. I say that because I'm from the Midwest as well. Okay. So. <laughs> I'm from the Northeast. We have sarcasm. <laughs> <laughs> I love myself some sarcasm. What do you find easiest about the writing process and what is your biggest challenge? Yeah, I have a lot of challenges. I love my favorite, favorite part about writing is the beginnings. And I am a pantser. I will sit down, even if I don't really know the characters' names, just those first few chapters, it all unfolds for me and I can write forever. And if I have been sitting on those characters for a while because their book hadn't come up yet and they've been marinating, then that was the one time I had this couple and they were book four. And when I finally got to start those books, I actually sat down and I just wrote all, I got 15,000 words that day. Whoa. And wow. That, yeah, it's not my norm at all. I think it's just <laughs> going to be a one-time thing and that's fine with me. But I I just am so in love with writing the beginnings of the books. And then I hit the middle and I question everything I've ever done in my life <laughs> and how it led me to that point. <laughs> But I know that, so it helps. Yeah, you know it's coming. <laughs> yes. Well, t speaking of, you know, the writing process, questioning yourself and all of that, uh, if you could give one piece of advice to a beginning writer, what would it be? I would always tell him what my husband said to me and was just write. Mm -hmm. Just sit down and write. And I, or however, however the story works for them, because I know, and I am like that too, where just Thinking about writing is good enough. Thinking about the story, but I suppose don't stop is maybe <laughs> go ahead and get started. Something along those lines is 
you can create and it'll it'll come. You can learn. You can adapt. It, it'll happen. Thinking about your catalog of books, if you could only recommend one of them, which one would you recommend? I like recommending my most recent one. And I'm not quite rapid releasing, but I am releasing some Dragon Shifters one. But in the Oil Baron series, I feel like those highlight the work and who I am better. And it's because they're more recent. I um, write more thoroughly. I don't have to travel or imagine I'm living where I'm writing it. So it's I feel like it's just more alive maybe than the other books. So I usually recommend the most recent one, which happens to be probably any of the oil barons when they come out, even if I'm releasing the other paranormal stuff. All right. Well, that wraps up our main question, uh, going to the bonus round, which we like to call Hot Six. Are you ready for these? Sure. Buckle up, listeners. It's time for Hot Six. Question number one. What is the most overrated book you've ever read? I'll admit to listening to your podcast and cheating on these hot six and thinking about my <laughs> Oh, yeah? Well, oh, we're, we're going to give you a new one. Oh, yeah. <laughs> my answer for this one is Romeo and Juliet. I guess I don't know what I had to read in school. Pretty much any of Shakespeare. I'm like, people enjoy this, huh? <laughs> it is not, not my, my, my old husband loves it. And I am. And every time Romeo and Juliet comes up, I just think, huh, it's just not my thing. But it's uh, withstood the test of time. So there's something there. It, it sure has. <laughs> for me, the thing that all of the Romeo and Juliet stories that are adapted for film or whatever, when they trim stuff, they always trim Friar Lawrence. And if you were to actually reread and focus on Friar Lawrence, like his decisions killed those children because oh, Romeo and Juliet boy. are children. And yeah. I think that for me is is the thing that that hooks me about Romeo and Juliet. Yeah. OK. What famous literary work have you never read, but you feel like you should have? Oh, Pride and Prejudice is a big one. And in the especially in romance, it's Jane Austen. I did finally start watching the movies, and I'm going to admit something that not many people admit. I am the movie watcher, not the book reader when it comes to that stuff. I would much prefer to watch a movie. But I did finally start watching The Pride and Prejudices, and I enjoy them. And I've watched some of, I think, the other Jane Austen movies. I wouldn't be able to name them, though. <laughs> <laughs> and I enjoy them, but I don't think I could sit and go through the book. Yeah. It probably would bog down a little bit too much for me. Now, if you could be any animal for one day, what would it be? Oh, an entitled house cat. <laughs> <laughs> With the sun patch? Yeah. Oh, like a good time. Oh, good that's, on, yeah, that, that's a popular one. I think I, I totally get that. What is your biggest grammatical pet peeve? I don't see this a lot in writing. I hear it a lot around here, and I'll see it in social media posts, the I seen I seen that the other day instead of I had seen or I mm. have seen. And I feel like I should probably write that into a lot of my characters, but I don't because I feel I'm I fear the readers will think it's a typo and not <laughs> right. part of our dial <laughs> uh, dialogue choice. But that's probably my biggest pet peeve. Looking back over your entire lifetime, what is your most embarrassing favorite song? Um, I would say I'm not necessarily embarrassed about it, but my husband loves to give me a hard time because I um, love Brian Adams' music from the 90s, and I love Summer of 69. Now, I'm, when I was writing this script, I left out the sixth question, so it may not so be one that one. she has had time to prepare for, you know? Oh. Uh -oh. Ready, ready, ready. <laughs> I'm such a rambler. That's my biggest worry. I don't know. My mind will go absolutely blank. All right. You can be one of your own characters for one week. Who will you be and what will you do? It's kind oh, of a I'm going to pick definitely one of the rich ones. <laughs> so is it while they're going through the book or afterwards, after they're rich already? <laughs> um, it is any point in, in their life that you want. You have their personality. You have their resources. You I are would them. probably pick, just, and I'm going to pick it because it's it's safe, but she was probably uh, safe like I am. But um, Kate from, in the Oil Kings book five, King's Queen, she was, grew up the quiet kid and then was, she became a librarian and I did work in the library for 
a few months before running the kids all over made it impossible. But so I have a soft spot for libraries and librarians. And then, yeah, she married uh, the hot guy and lived really wealthy life. So <laughs> I'm going to go with that because I just want someone to clean my house and plan my meals. <laughs> oh, that, that sounds would be lovely. Hard work. <laughs> awesome. We're coming over. Yes. <laughs> I'd have room for everybody. All right. This has been great, Marie. Thank you so much for joining us on Flock Talk. This has been a lot of fun. Thank you. Bye. Thanks. You've been listening to Flock, Flock Talk, Talk, the podcast where we feature your favorite authors and narrators. Hosted by Craig Hart and Sarah Hannon. This podcast is produced by Pink Flamingo Productions. Pink Flamingo Productions. Editing by Craig Hart. Visit us today at pinkflamingoproductions.com. Pink Flamingo Productions.